That's why I'm here. Now, Mark, when you were doing catalogs of dinosaurs, well, you know, did you have to amass a lot of uh, research to make the dinosaurs look authentic? Well, they don't look authentic. I mean, to be honest with you. Really? I said, I'm out of here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm crushed. No, I, I, you know, I do, I do gather information, but the point when I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a story. It's a dramatic presentation, mm -hmm. and I, I don't stick to the facts. I, I use what's going to make the story dramatic, so there are no way any attempt to be authentic. Well, have they ever, have they ever figured out whether the T-Rexes could actually run? Because a bunch of years ago, that was really a long discussion with computer models and stuff, the size and stuff like that. Well, wasn't there, wasn't there, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Wasn't there a, a, someone who did uh, some extrapolate the, yeah. or extrapolate, whatever I'm trying to say. Extrapolate. Yeah. <laughs> the distance between the footprints that they, it was actually a run. And that's what I heard. They, they figured like 35 miles an hour they could. Okay, because there was, there, these are pretty large animals. There was a lot of discussion years ago about whether T-Rexes really could actually run and, and were, as a result, were they just really scavengers? Well, Horner, or, James Horner, the guy that the, the right. scientist yes. is based on in, in Jurassic Park, thinks they were scavengers, that they were too big to actually hunt and they just ate carcasses. Huh. But I talked to other people like Phil Curry, who's another leading theropod, but paleontologist, and he says, no, you don't have the equipment they had if you're a, a scavenger. He had, they had hunting equipment, their musculature. Well, also, if they were scavengers and found a carcass, nobody else would get in their way if they decided to eat the carcass. That would, right. would, that would be one of the things. And I'm sure they took advantage of it. If you found a carcass, you know, you, you were a tyrannosaur, I'm sure you'd eat it. But also, then I, I think I read that the T-Rex's uh, uh, head, the, 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 the olfactory, is similar to a turkey vulture. Or scavengers. Which were scavengers, yeah. 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 But would they be that size if they were scavengers? Aren't scavengers usually smaller? Because they, they would the size. Yeah. I don't know. Well, if they, back then, they'd be big enough animals that were dead. They'd be able, if they found some of the big carcasses, they'd, yeah. they'd have a lot of food if they drove the other guys off. But, but the, the one thing that's fun is it's just, it, it's just the research changes over the years. Yeah. When I was a kid, there was, you know, the whole school thought about sauropods, like, well, Baronosaurus back then, the Apatosaur was that he was so big that he couldn't actually walk unsupported because it would have torn the cartilage in his knees. I'm not sure how they arrived at that because he was really large. But the result was they were just, they put him in water. Um, I have a little Charles R. Knight drawing, actually, with a sort of Veronosaurus in the swamp up to, you know, up to his back, just about the back sort of shows over the swamp. A little sketch, like a little chalk sketch. And uh, so they thought they had to be in the water in order to support their, they tear their knees up. That's why you didn't see. You didn't, that's why you didn't see tail tracks occasionally, because obviously the tail was floating in the water as they walked along. And then eventually, there's some Rosalind just got a reproduction of a painting of a no, uh, uh, Burian. Is Burian right? Burian. 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 One of his paintings of like a uh, brachiosaur, I think, completely submerged with its. It's a cutaway of the of the water, it's, and it's enormous because it's a huge dinosaur. And the head's up, and there's this little bump on the top of his head that has the nostrils in it. So that's like a little snorkel that's up there. And then they've done work since then that suggests that the weight of you know, water is really heavy. And the idea is there's not a chance in hell that dinosaurs, they just didn't have the muscle power, nobody does, to be able to breathe if you're like 20 feet underwater to suck the air in and expand your, expand your body. You just can't do it. So clearly the water deal just didn't work like that. And now they, they see more up like giraffes. They're sort of more, they are out in the open. They're out walking around, their cartilage is fine. You know, they don't drag their tails because their tails aren't on the ground. They're eating right. the tops of trees. And then Fred Flintstone's on top using it. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> using slaying that tail. They, well, work, they work perfectly. It's crazy. Well, growing up, you know, Fred Flintstone's dinosaurs, you know, were some of my first exposure. But also, there was a gas station chain called Sinclair. Sure. They had the big green brontosaurus mm -hmm. as their mascot, who also had a Macy's Day balloon for a while. So, you know, that to me, that was a dinosaur. And a display at the New York World's Fair. They had Dino Land and the World's yes. Fair in 63, 64. They had Dino Land, and they had animatronic. Oh, they, had animatronic. Yeah. They, moved, they moved a little bit. They they had a, but they also had displays back in 39 or 30. The, more than 39 was the World's 39. Fair. Yeah, yeah. New York. Yeah. They had a long standing. Uh, so I think they had a, they had a brontosaurus, or whatever, whatever it was, a sauropod of some kind. I think it actually stuck out over. What would that be? Wouldn't be the LIE? What's the road? The, the Grand Central Parkway? Yeah, I think. it was. I think it was right because it was on the other side of the Grand Central Parkway, the main part of the fair. So the head of the sauropod looked out over the road as you were driving by. You could look up. I'm sure they caused some crashes before people got used to it. <laughs> I can imagine. Pretty awesome. 
Now, given some of these limitations, just the, the sheer size of these creatures, plus um, some are slow moving, some, you know, there had to have been storytelling challenges in using dinosaurs, in, in you know, telling an entertaining story. So, how much you know liberty do you have to take to, to pull this off? Well, as, as Mark said, it, it's you know anything that I've ever done related to any kind of dinosaur or dinosaur-like monster. It's it's pure fantasy, so there's really not any limitation to, to what I you know. I mean, the stories that I've done, it's kind of whatever fits. Okay. Uh, the limitation, well, what, if the drawing looks right, you're there. Right. Well, what about guns and dinos? Is that? Uh, I'm still writing and drawing that. Um, that, I mean, my, uh, I mean, I, I, my stuff up until guns and dino is just pure fantasy. It's a half-naked woman fighting a dinosaur, come on, you know. That there's no scientific uh, <laughs> <laughs> fact behind that. Uh, but with Guns and Dinos, it was, this is, um, which I'm hoping to have it done by next year, it's pretty much pure science fiction. I'm actually uh, telling about uh, time travel, about the whole quantum uh, wormholes uh, at the quantum level, and how they built this machine, and, blah, blah, and then you have the dinosaurs, and, um, and I actually kind of like change, or actually that's, that was a really tricky part because like the more I read about the dinosaur stuff, the more it became uh, kind of harder to write because it was like it, you, you kind of really put a lot of uh, up-to-date facts about dinosaurs and, it, and they're, it's kind of, they're, they're kind of all over the map. I mean, it's, it, you kind of become like a, almost like an an animal behavior scientist. How, how would they re really react to a situation and all that? And so I've been having a lot of fun. And so I, so it's Guns and Dinos about an army base that gets transported back in time by accident. So human, I mean, I, I know human, you know, they're all a bunch of crazy nut jobs. So uh, <laughs> they see something big, they'll shoot it. So that was kind of easy, their motivation. Uh, but the dinosaur, that was kind of a tricky part. So I'm still kind of, wrestling with some of the scenes. And there are a lot, I mean, there are, like the thing with the T-Rex running, there are a lot of different thoughts, schools of thoughts about how they behave, what they did. You, and if you're trying to be accurate, you still have to pick and choose. I mean, you're, is it, it isn't like all this stuff is totally solved. You go to the book, you get the answer, and you just do that. You really have to, I mean, I really just, I didn't, I didn't do, I was doing that, and that issue of the FF, we got a Spinosaurus show up. And I did not go back and research if Spinosaurus could run, or if they couldn't run, I just had him charging hell bent for leather out of the, leather out of the jungle to Fantastic Four with his mouth open. And it looked good, and that was I was done. So I didn't really work hard. I, I try to make them look right as much as I can. I try to make them look accurate within, again, the meaning of reconstruction. I mean, there's a lot of stuff people have, have discovered since I was really paying attention back in the 60s. There's tons of stuff. But there's still a lot of questions that you just have to kind of answer yourself and answer your drawings. Take an educated guess. The closest thing my work has ever been to scientific is I had a giant uh, dinosaur monster in the goon screaming broken Spanish. Because clearly he wouldn't be able to speak proper Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> They're tiny wallets. There's yeah. yeah. tiny brains. Of course they, they wouldn't know anything about grammar. <laughs> He's lucky to know a few words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so there's been uh, like a whole subgenre of, of Artists who paint dinosaurs, and have, you know, illustrate books about dinosaurs and all. Um, do you guys have favorite artists of dinosaurs other than yourselves? Yeah, all of these guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm stuck on something. I look at Mark's stuff and I, I trace it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of him, even though the dinosaurs have been redone a lot since then. Charles R. Knight was probably the first really good painter of animals who did dinosaurs under scientific direction and tried to get them as accurate. I mean, even, it was a lot, he was working in the late, late 1800s, died about 1950 or so, I think. And so, but he's still got, he has one painting of a couple of uh, theropods going at each other, kind of leaping, I mean, very, a very modern looking kind of thing where they're really, one's jumping on top of the other. But he also has stuff, there's a, a I mean, one of my favorite dinosaurs is a Stegosaurus, and he's got a, an early Stegosaurus, an early version of one, rather, which is you know nicely done with about eight spikes along the tail, 
And I don't, I don't know if they have more information now than they had. They, they used to have when I was doing this stuff. You, know, you see stegosaurs, they have these big plates along the back, and they kind of alternate them. They have one here, and one here, and one here, and they're kind of overlapping. And at least in the 50s, early 60s, that was all based on one specimen that had like three plates overlapped. There was a plate here, a plate on top, and then a plate under here. And that's all they had. I don't know if they have more stuff that's in place, because you know, often fossils aren't in place. You know, the skeleton's not always, you know, it's great when you find it, but it's not always articulated. It's not always the way it looked in real life. And it often it's crushed by the weight of the rock that was above it when it's fossilized. So I don't know whether they really had those. You know, there are some, I, I, one of my favorites, I would like to draw one of these guys. I mean, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs did a stegosaurus in his Pellucidor books. And when the stego, you know, guy's looking up, the stegosaurus is like, ah, very, very aggressive in Edgar Rice Burroughs' books. And it leaps off the cliff, and of course it's this giant thing going, oh my god! And then the plates go, flap, like flat now, and it glides down right after this guy. And I'm going, oh, that's awesome! But I'm, I have some questions about how that works. Like, weight, weight versus glide ratio. But it looks fabulous. And there are all these drawings of stegosaurs over the years. There's one that looks like it has golf balls for slash. He's got this little, all these little pebbled surface things. There's one where he's up on his hind legs walking around. And, so there, I mean, I love that stuff. I love old, fabulous illustrations of dinosaurs. There's a guy, named Mark Hallett, is one of the guys who does illustrations. He's got a mementosaur, which is a, um, a sauropod. Very, very, very long neck. I can't believe it actually worked like that. It's so long. But it's this blue, key toned painting of the, of the presumably the mother and the little guy walking along. It's, and it's just a fabulous, if you never painted anything else in dinosaurs, I would love this guy because that painting, that's actually, a print of that's hanging in our house because I just thought that painting itself is so fabulous and it's just a wonderful piece of work. And there are, you know, but I like, I mean, Nev Parker, I kind of like, I haven't seen a lot of his work, you know, they're a classic guy probably from the 40s and 50s. Um, and you see his stuff swiped, I've seen, he has a Gorgosaur, but I've, Gorgosaurus I've seen swiped by artists and comics and everywhere else, book covers and stuff for years. Um, I love Frazetta's dinosaurs. They're, I mean, they're really Charles R. Knighty right. stuff, but they're just, they look great. He's got such a great sense of volume. Um, so there are a lot of people, and there are a million guys now that have done it, but I, I, there was a book I had, I think Sheeler might have been his name, one of the books I had as a kid. It was a dinosaur book in black and white illustration. He was a curator at the, I think, the Pittsburgh Museum? Cleveland. Where was it? Cleveland. In Cleveland, Cleveland. And it was a book, I forgot the name of the book now, he won on dinosaurs, won on mammals. And they had, you know, short entries in the text he'd written, and then a full-page drawing, black and white in tone, of the dinosaurs. And they were lovely drawings. I don't know how accurate they'd be now if you went back and looked at them, but they were lovely drawings. And I, that's, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to all that stuff. I like it, whether if it's scientifically accurate or just, a, you know, a lovely piece of work. Um, you might draw the line of the science, but there's a lot of really neat stuff out there. I mean, I look at a lot of... Um uh, actually, I really enjoy James Kirby's stuff, Dinotopia, and oh, I, sure. I actually have a subscription to uh, Prehistoric Time magazine. So a lot of the dino reference, I go through that magazine and uh, and use that. And I actually have a couple of dinosaur toys. I think there's a uh, I've got the lion, it might be Carnage or something like that uh, toy, which had a really nice uh, T Rex and uh, and. Uh, Velociraptor, uh, and I think they're more kind of based on the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, which are more aggressive looking. So I have those two toys and a couple other dinosaur toys over the years that I've got, and I use that as models mostly. T Rexes are fun in toys because with a modern version where they're you know leveled out front and back, they either have to put bigger feet on them so you can have them stand up properly, <laughs> or the tail kind of goes. Like that, so you make a tripod out of the, you know, the feet and the tail. <laughs> so there, you, you could, it, those are just funny. I think those are, they could look really good, but then you kind of look at the tail, and go, uh, maybe. Who did that book, uh, Life Before Man? Knight. Knight. Was yeah, it? Charles Knight. That's a great book. Yeah, yeah illustrations. And, and Knight, Knight is the fountainhead for everything we do. How he, yes. he, like you mentioned, he understood animal anatomy. He was an anatomist, and he could look at the, the fossil evidence of dinosaurs, and well. The scientists were saying tail dragging, living in water. He was, you know, he would do a little bit of that to satisfy him, but then he would also do his own thing. He did more the tails off the ground, like you said, much more aggressive jumping. And it turns out, over time, now we're coming around to seeing that he was way ahead of his time in understanding that. I mean, sometimes artists, artists will get that. There's a some guy. There are medical illustrations are really as a field that's very exacting. It's very demanding. You're, you're drawing organs. You're painting, or you're painting anatomy, you're painting, but whatever it is, 
there was some text, I don't remember the artist's name anymore, it was just a text from 1800 to 1800s, I think. And it turned out there's, there's text along with it, and then these illustrations of whoever this artist was had done. And it turns out that book is valuable now not because of the text, because you know, our medical knowledge presumably is better than it was in 1830 or whenever this book was done. But it turns out this guy put all kinds of stuff in, these, in the drawings he was doing that nobody had seen or nobody understood or nobody talked about back then. The drawings are astoundingly accurate and they're still good. They're still, we know so much more. And this guy was seeing it and putting it down on paper or whatever he's painting on in a way that, you know, that was way beyond where the medical knowledge of the time was, which I thought was pretty nifty. So he was a serial killer? It probably was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I prefer to think of a student, a student of anatomy. So. In the time we've got left, is there anything you guys want to know from our panelists? Yes? I have a two-part question. First, a compliment that's a question. First, the compliment being one thing I hear continuously as you guys talk to me. I didn't remember you, sir. This, that, and that thing. And it's, it's great to hear you guys talk about how much research you guys put into it, whereas a lot of people don't realize how much work you put into it. So that means a lot. Two, how many times do you find yourself getting lost in research and have so much fun that next thing you know the deadline is right on top? <laughs> if I have a deadline, I don't lose myself too much. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to have a job next week. If I'm too late with the job this week, I have no job next week. No checks come in, so you, it's sort of a self-correcting mechanism to some extent. Uh, but then I'm, most of my work up until fairly recently has been for monthly periodicals or you know, quarterly or even bi monthly, whatever, through Marvel and DC, where the deadlines, you know, in the old days, the deadlines really were, were hard and fast deadlines. You, I did one, I helped draw one issue of Master of Kung Fu with three friends of mine, Alan Milgram, Jim Starlin, and uh, Alan Weiss. We penciled the entire issue in two days, and Sal Trapani inked it and pulled it all together, sort of. And uh, <laughs> because, because that book was going out, and they, I don't know what happened, I don't know whether the artist had, crapped out, I don't know what, but that book had to go out Thursday or whatever that was, and so we started, we, we pulled, we, they all came over to our apartment, me and Milgram were out in Queens, the four of us just sat there drawing our brains out for two days, got the whole thing done, so at that time the deadlines were much harder and faster, I think now they're more flexible about some of that stuff, so maybe you could take longer and get lost and stuff, or independent guys who don't have those deadlines themselves, have to set their own deadlines, might be different. Yeah, I look at the deadline in my rear view mirror window, <laughs> and I just wave at it, you know? I'm going to look at more dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir? Um, you know, a lot of your works featured the terrestrial dinosaurs. Has that been most, and not as many of the aquatic ones, uh, please your source, things like that, has that been mostly because of the, the story of, of, and the body of the work, the story that's being told, or do you have kind of a fascination mostly with terrestrial ones, or do you also enjoy a lot of the, the aquatic type ones? Well, first off, dinosaurs were only terrestrial. There were no aquatic dinosaurs or flying dinosaurs. Those are other, other creatures, but... Check out the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Mr. Pedant, but I'll say the nerd is fine. <laughs> oh, man. But um, we know what you mean. But with, yeah, with, yeah. Well, you know, that's where people exist, too. And if you're going to do a comic with people, it's easier to... The, the, the aquatic stuff is great, creepy stuff, too. If I'd ever drawn Aquaman, or written Aquaman, that's a whole different deal. But, you know, most of the stories are, most of the ones I've done, anyway, maybe all of them are really terrestrial. I haven't, I haven't gone down into the inky depths. Um, but I certainly would. I mean, it's something awesome. It's, there's just some great fish down there. You get deep enough, there's just some really creepy oh, fish. Oh, yeah. That would be they're, they're fantastic to draw. So, but it's more a matter of where the stories take you. It's not so much like, I don't want to draw those ocean, those ocean bit going non-dinosaurs. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to blow those guys off. Young lady. Thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, how old you guys were when you first saw Wizard of Caves Gertie the Dinosaur? Oh. Oh. Gertie the Dinosaur being the first animated dinosaur, 1905 was it? Something like that. Like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, probably a, almost a grown up. I don't think I saw. I wasn't a I, mean, I was a kid in the fifties, so didn't get shown. It might. I think I saw probably a section of it on Disneyland or Disney World. They did. They did some old stuff, and they, I don't think they showed the whole film, but I think they showed a clip from Gertie. Um, I think maybe without explaining 
don't know if they'd explain how it was used. It was actually a, a film that a guy named Windsor McKay did, who did the Little Nemo and Sunglass, he's best known for. And my favorite part of that is that McKay was one of the earliest animators. I think he thought he was the mm -hmm. earliest. I'm not sure he was exactly, but it's, it's early days for animation, no matter what. And now, you know, animators do key drawings, and then they fill in, they have in-betweeners, and they fill in, do all that stuff. And he didn't do any of that stuff. He just drew drawing number one, drawing number two, drawing number He drew thousands of drawings in order. And the Gertie the Dinosaur was really a vaudeville presentation when they still had vaudeville theater. Because he, he would had, interact he'd come on stage. He would, he would come on stage in his tux to begin with. He would explain what he was going to do, introduce the Gertie the Dinosaur. And he said, I'll be with you in a minute. And he'd step off the stage, and he'd open up the stuff. And then a little animated Windsor McKay would walk out in the screen and he'd say, Gertie, come on out here. Or he, it, was a sign, it was a silent title, it was a silent film. It was a Gertie, and then the dinosaur would come out and had a landscape. And he wasn't doing a cell over a painted landscape. He was drawing the entire landscape in every drawing. Right. And he did more than one animated film. I'm not sure how he lived long enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't but, get but, that. But, yeah, Gertie was certainly you know, an eye opener to, to you know, how and early some of the stuff was done technically. And maybe, it may be the first animated film where the animated character, in this case Gertie the Dinosaur, actually had personality. Yeah. There are some other animations that are, that are really, that are like transformational, where stuff would get big or small or stretch or whatever. But the, as far as actually being a character, Gertie is clearly a character. She interacts with Windsor McKay, with the animated Windsor McKay, and she really, she's really charming. It's completely worth seeing. I mean, you could probably stream it on Netflix or just, you, I'm sure it's on YouTube. It'd be out of copyright. And sure. possibly the single funniest animated minute of film I've ever seen was Bambi Meets Godzilla. Uh, <laughs> Maybe the funniest 15 seconds. I think. Yeah. <laughs> that was a short film. <laughs> yeah. If you've never seen it, it's on YouTube. It's worth, it's worth a look just for the combination. Timing is everything. Yep. <laughs> Got time for like one more question if anybody has something? Yes, sir. You ever get wrong and people come and complain about it? Have you had people, I mean, you've seen people on the research. People all, all, the fans, all the fans we've known are far too gracious to ever. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody in this room and anything we've ever done. Um, I mean, part of the problem there also is the research changes. Sure. When I've done comics now long enough ago, the stuff I put in there uh, isn't accurate, isn't, isn't really uh, true anymore. But, you know, occasionally, you do occasionally have someone nudge you about the, uh, the inaccuracy of your material. Uh, adults are usually pretty cool about it, but hell hath no fury like a seven-year-old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you've met their expectations. Well, if that's the case, did you consult with uh, CBS when they animated uh, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs to make sure the dinosaurs were as accurate as possible? No. <laughs> no, that's uh, Hollywood is its own thing, and you know you get the hell out of the way if you want it made. So they they did their their versions of whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thank you all for your time and attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. These guys are all downstairs in their boots. You should visit. Can you take a group shot of us? You know.